In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You might find the text of the Mass different in your Missal, because this Missal is printed in 1928. So, the Declaration of the Dogma of the Assumption was in 1950 by Pope Pius XII. So this Missal was long before that, de that dogma defined. But it, it does go to show, and I have no other missiles, so this is the only one I have right now on this pilgrimage. Normally I would use the, the Mass that Pius XII did, but your missiles probably have it. But it does go to show that there's a, a, a duplex first class with an octave for the Assumption long before the dogma was ever declared a dogma of the faith. So this just goes to prove against the scoffers, against the Catholic Church, they say, oh, your popes make up dogmas down the history of the Church. They make up what you want to believe, and they just make it up, and you're forced to believe it. But that's not true, and this is, this is a proof of it. This missile's printed in 1928, and it has a solemn mass of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary because it was always believed from the Apostles. There are churches built in honor of the Assumption of Mary throughout the world, especially in Spain and in the Middle East before the Muslims destroyed them. So it's, it's a proof, another answer to those scoffers that, no, we don't believe in the Assumption of Mary just because Pope Pius XII declared it a dogma, but Catholics have always believed this. The only reason Pope Pius XII would declare the dogma, or Pope Pius IX with the Immaculate Conception in 1854, is to declare, to give honor to God and the Virgin Mary, that it's, it's, it is bound by belief that we believe these things because it's part of Catholic doctrine and Catholic tradition. It also is another proof of the beauty of Catholic tradition because everything we believe, every, every gesture of the Mass, that the priest does and every sacrament, it all comes from the Blessed Trinity to Christ, Christ to the Apostles, the Apostles to the, to the, the, the bishops and priests that they ordained and consecrated, down to the end of the world. So even my priesthood, my, my priesthood, even though I'm unworthy to be a priest, my priesthood comes from Bishop Williamson who consecrate, who ordained me, he was consecrated a bishop by Archbishop Lefebvre. And Archbishop Lefebvre was ordained by Cardinal Leonard, and Cardinal Leonard was ordained by another, and so forth and so forth. When you, when you backtrack, the lineage of Archbishop Lefebvre goes back to St. Pius V. His, uh, his lineage of priestly priestly ordination and Episcopal consecration goes back to Pope St. Pius V, and his lineage goes back to St. John the Apostle, who was consecrated a priest by Christ himself. So that's the beauty of the Catholic Church also, is that, is that the Catholic priesthood, which is physically laying down the hands on the head and anointing with the, the oil of catechumens, the, the hands by the bishop, and then closing them and then wrapping them with the manutergium, the cloth that wraps the hands, manutergium, there, that laying of hands on a particular man, never a woman, always a man, that lineage goes right back to Christ, to all valid priests and all truly valid bishops. So, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the, her great feast today, this this Mass is before Pius XII's de declaration of the dogma of the Assumption, but it just proves Catholics have always loved Our Lady, always believed her Assumption into Heaven. It's not some new dogma of the 1950s, far from it. In fact, the saints tell us, like Saint Athanasius and Saint, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon and also the great Saint What's his name again? Anyway. This saint, they all say the same thing. 
And in fact, Vatican I, in 1870, the Council of Vatican I, declared that the Pope has no right to invent new doctrines or novelties or change any of the doctrines. Or, and if he does, that is not under the guidance of the Holy Ghost. So Vatican I clearly defines what all these saints of the past said and reinforces it that the Pope has the duty to hand down Catholic tradition. He does not have the right to invent new doctrines and change Catholic faith and doctrine. But that's exactly what we've seen since Vatican II. And that's why we've the fight for tradition is a bloody fight. It's a war. Because this Pope now, Pope Francis, is doing everything now to crush Catholic tradition. He's coming after the traditional groups. He's tr and in, in Chicago, the Christ the King Institute was just shut down completely, kicked out of the whole diocese. And they're coming after St. Peter's because they're all under the bishops and the bishops are, can easily just dissolve them or kick them out or demand that they say the new mass. So this is happening more and more. So pray for these priests who are being persecuted like this, that they come to realize that the real stand is the stand of Archbishop Lefebvre. That we don't make any peace with Vatican II and the new mass and all that new garbage, but stay with Catholic tradition for real. And all the doctrine and all the morals. Just stay with that. Our Lady's Assumption. Here we are under beautiful pine trees in a quiet park in Santa Rosa, California. And all these trees point to heaven and they give some shelter from the sun. It's kind of like a garden. And all the first man, man's history goes back to a garden. Adam was made from the slime of the earth and then God gave him the garden of paradise. And then Adam had command over all the animals, birds, everything in creation. He named it all. Adam had full wisdom, and he lived 930 years. So that wisdom he taught to his sons and grandsons and great, 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 a hundred times great grandsons. And he had knowledge of how to build computers. He had knowledge of how to build a car. He had knowledge of how to build airplanes. That's why there is evidence there is actual evidence of electromagnetic plating, batteries, aircraft, and technology that far surpasses our technology now, before the flood of Noah. There are the monoliths, huge pieces of rock cut and carved with perfect angles, and sometimes with staggered angles, which no modern machinery today can even replicate. They don't know how it's done. But whatever technology they had, bef had before the flood, that was a lot thanks to Adam. And remember, Methuselah, who lived 969 years, he knew Adam and Eve. And he lived long enough to see Noah. He knew Noah. And then Noah uh, built the ark and was saved to his family in the flood from the flood. But Methuselah died about seven years before the flood, which was about, about 2,000 years after the creation, after the fall of Adam and Eve. So 2,000 years since Christ, look how decadent we've become as a modern society. We're killing our babies, butchering our old people, tearing out organs, living in sin like it's normal, blaspheming God's name, working on Sundays, Marrying, divorcing, marrying, divorcing, marrying, divorcing, and then drug addiction, alcohol addiction, impure addictions, impurities of all sorts, which things that animals don't even think of doing. Now the rainbow flag, they think of doing this and they want to spread their garbage. And they're a dying breed, this sodomite race. They're a dying breed because they have no children. They can't have children. So our age has, has become corrupt. So from the creation of Adam and Eve to the flood was about 2,000 years. So that shows us man can fall very decadent, very fast. It has happened before. So 
in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, Eve formed from the side of Adam in the Garden of Paradise. It was Eve, our first mother, who ate of the fruit after her dialogue with the devil. The snake tricked her and lied to her, and Eve fell for it. And, and, and then Adam fell for Eve's solicitations. But on the assumption, we're reminded of the greatness of Our Lady, because everything that happened with Eve was restored by the Virgin Mary. Eve brought death. The second Eve, Mary, brought us the life, the life of grace, the life of the Redeemer, the life of the supernatural life of the soul. So even, even the first greeting of the angel Gabriel broke that long darkness and silence because the angel St. Gabriel spoke to Mary and said, Ave. And we say that all the time in Latin, Ave Maria, Ave Maria. Ave spelled backwards is Eva. And St. Irenaeus makes the point that the angel was appraising Mary because she's going to be the true Eve that will not betray the human race and lead, lead us to death. Ave, she says, because the angel says, St. Gabriel, because Mary will be the one to restore. So in her dialogue, in her conversation with the archangel St. Gabriel, she will say yes to God. Eve said no to God, but the, true virgin, the second Eve, Mary, will say yes to God. And at that yes, the Redeemer was conceived in her womb by the power of the Holy Ghost. She was a mother at age 15. And with the holy marriage with St. Joseph, the child Jesus grew. So God took on hands, feet, a head, a heart from Mary's blood, from her womb. God chose to take on flesh through Mary. This is why the Virgin Mary is called the co-redemptrix because she is so closely tied in with the redemption. Why? Because God doesn't have a body. He's invisible. He doesn't have material body, the pure Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But God chose to take on a body through the Virgin Mary. He could have done it any way. He could have just done it right off with his, with his word. But he chose to come through Mary. And St. Louis de Montfort says, God chose to come to us through Mary. He expects us to come back to him through Mary. And Mary is, you know, the Protestants and the scoffers always attack the Catholic Church. You give too much honor to Mary. You worship Mary. Everything's Mary. And what about Jesus? Well, that's just stupidity, really. Because Mary does never want to be separated from our Lord Jesus Christ. Never. She doesn't want to be separated from him and she bows her head like Our Lady of Guadalupe. Her head is in a position of bowing to God. So Mary and Jesus are one. The heart of Jesus and Mary are beat the same pulse. So Mary is tied up close to the redemption because she gave God the body that would be sacrificed on the cross. And Archbishop Sheen even says that when you drink the precious blood of Jesus in Holy Communion, you also, by extension, since Jesus got his blood from the heart of Mary, you drink also the heart of Mary when you drink his precious blood at Holy Communion, which you do. Your mouth is stained with his precious blood in Holy Communion because you receive not just the body, but the whole body the whole soul, the whole divine Godhead, the burning fire of God himself, and his soul and divinity, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, we consume at Holy Communion. It's a tremendous proof of the love of God, excessive love of God. So we want to ask the Virgin Mary to burn in us a great love of God, and very soon you're going to be kneeling at Calvary 
Wherever the priest says Mass, a true Catholic valid Mass, the Virgin Mary is always there next to the priest. When we kneel down at the consecration in the silence around the canon of the Mass, the millions of angels that descend in the Santa Rosa Valley here, all the millions of angels are already gathering for the great event of the sacrifice of the Mass. And when we kneel, we're kneeling at Calvary and Jesus Christ is on the cross and he blesses you and he really loves you. Christ really died for your soul. He really loves you more than, you know, my words are just hot air. He proved it on the letter, as St. John Chrysostom says, Christ wrote us, no, St. Augustine says, the love letter from heaven, which are the scriptures, but then the biggest punch of his love letter is the tree, paper is made from the trees, and the ink on this love letter is his blood because the cross was soaked in Christ's precious blood. So the cross, if you ever have a relic of the true cross, when you venerate it, you don't bow to it like the other relics of saints. You have to genuflect. The relics of true cross are honored with a genuflection because it's, it shares in the precious blood of Jesus, which is honored with the, with the veneration of what's called latria, the highest veneration to God himself. So whatever touches Christ's blood, are soaked in it like the cross must be honored with the genuflection. So the tree of the cross is the love letter of God. And that love letter is not just some paper Hallmark card, but really becomes present on the altar. This is the Mass. So imagine the joy in heaven today of all the angels, all the armies of angels around the Virgin Mary, all the saints and the Holy Trinity. Imagine the joy of heaven around the Virgin Mary today. <clears throat> Imagine the great happiness of all the saints who thank her. All the saints today will go and thank her for saying yes to God, unlike Eve, and giving us the Redeemer in, through whose precious blood we can be washed from original sin and live, given the state of grace and get to heaven. And, the, and in confession, the precious blood of Jesus repeatedly washes away the sin by his precious blood. The happiness of heaven must be, well, uh, there's no words that can explain that. But we step into heaven at Mass. At the Mass, we step into the eternal time where there is no time. At Mass, you breathe that air of heaven Time stops at Mass and we enter into eternity. This is the sacred Mass. And we enter into heaven in a way. And Our Lady on this day, traditionally, she also descends down into purgatory and frees all the souls who loved her in any way, devoted to her. So it's our privilege in these times, since Our Lady came to Fatima in 1917, we know that if you have a great love for the Virgin Mary, do her five first Saturdays, which all of you better do. You have to do. You've got to be an idiot not to do it. The five first Saturdays, make sure you mark your calendar. Make sure you do it. Because the promise Our Lady gave, if you fulfill the five first Saturdays, you will have all the graces to die a holy death in the state of grace, and you'll save your soul. And then Our Lady adds something else that those who are, love her Immaculate Heart, they will, she says, I will place them right before the throne of God. You'll have a special place in heaven and a supreme happiness unlike any other time, only because you love the Immaculate Heart of Mary, are devoted to her. That's why we love our rosary. We want to carry the rosary in our pockets. We don't want to be anywhere without our 59 bullet machine gun. The rosary. The devil hates it. It's a weapon that conquers enemies of the church, conquers sin, drives out devils, draws down grace. It's so powerful that Our Lady told Sister Lucia that those who pray the rosary, there's no problem that cannot be solved by praying the rosary. Are you having a problem? Are you having a difficulty discerning what, I, what God wants you to do? Pray the rosary. Do you have problems with people? Are your boss? 
pray your rosary. If you have problems with your wife and your children, pray your rosary. You have problem paying bills, and some of you, when you get married, you're going to have that difficulty sometimes supporting the family, pray the rosary. And it's a mistake of many men, when they have problems in their marriage, they go to the bar, they go to bad friends, they go to smoking marijuana, and they go to all the wrong places, or to another woman, which is even worse, instead of going to God and the Blessed Mother. That's what's got to be fixed in your mind, in our mind, and mine too. When you got a problem and a difficult dilemma, and you're going to have this, where do we turn to? Our Blessed Mother. Pray the Rosary. It is so simple, but the devil hates it. He fears it. And it's a simple weapon. And of course, the brown scapular, which Our Lady said, those who die wearing it will not suffer eternal fire. And some people try to commit suicide with their scapular on, and they won't go underwater. <laughs> they just can't sink. And they tie their hands and feet, and they just can't drown. And one of them, some of them who survived this, changed their heart, went to confession, and, and straightened out their life. But some, there's one case of a guy who was drowning, tried to commit suicide, tore off his scapular. Then he went under. Bad sign. A sign that you're going to go to heaven is you love the Virgin Mary, pray her rosary, wear her scapular. A sign that you and I will go to hell is we ignore her, we don't wear her scapular, we don't really love to pray the rosary. And you might say, well, Father, the rosary is just so boring. It's just repeat the Hail Mary over and over again, and your Father. Well, we're not pigeons. We're not parrots. Our Lord says, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's not how we're supposed to be. When we pray the rosary, meditate on the mystery of Christ's life, on the agony of the garden, on the Annunciation. And to go deeper in these things, you've got to do spiritual reading. So I always come back to that importance of spiritual reading. And you realize we wouldn't have had St. Augustine if he didn't do spiritual reading, because that's what converted him. We wouldn't have had St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits and sent all these missionaries all over the world, if it wasn't for spiritual reading. Even Father Juniper Serra, the great missionary and apostle of California, he loved the spiritual reading, especially the scriptures and the breviary, which every priest is bound to pray. And I read somewhere, I did read somewhere that, it's on, a, on a side note, that he was disgusted with the European universities starting to swallow the Copernican ideas. And because of that, he, came, he wanted to come as a missionary here. So pray to Father Juniper Serra, pray to him, we're kind of following his trail, and ask him and the Virgin Mary on her Assumption Day, the great love of our, our Blessed Mother. Another consideration is with Father Serra, from when he came to California, it was 1700s, it was only 200 years before, so to give you a, a time frame structure, uh, from here, George Washington to our time is 200 years or so. Our Lady appeared in 1531. 200 years later, Father Serra comes. And with all those great Franciscans, converted Mexico and all of North America, <coughs> or at least on the West. So that, that, that fire that Our Lady ignited, appearing in Guadalupe, leaving her image, it, it filled all their hearts with a great love for Our Lady to spread her love and devotion everywhere to all the wild Indians and savages and to put an end to the satanic human sacrifices. So there's no doubt when Father Sarah came, and as you heard in that talk, um, one of the priests took out the image of Our Lady Guadalupe and the Indian, the whole tribe went and bowed. So that's, they loved Our Lady Guadalupe, and imagine the fire in the hearts of these uh, uh, Franciscans who were bringing these nations of the Indians to Our Lady, and through her to Christ, 
and the Holy Catholic faith. And how many souls went to heaven because of these missionaries? And our world needs a new wave of missionaries because we got a new paganism, a whole new debauched, decadent, godless age. This world needs another army of soldiers of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, priests, brothers, monks, and fathers of families to convert this world. Because the pagans today are worse than anything Father Sarah met. In St. Isaac Jogues in, the, in New York, he describes the, they walked around with no clothes, they did all kinds of impurities in the open. He said it was, <laughs> what he had to deal with was savagery. So our age is worse because we know Christ. Those Indians didn't. So post-paganism is worse than the, the, the pagans that know, don't know Christ. Let's honor our Blessed Mother now. Let's go with the angels to the foot of Calvary, begging Our Lady to inflame us with a great love for her. And when you see the host elevated, remember to think of Christ white and pale like the host, white and pale on the cross. He lost a lot of blood, so his face was truly, what could be seen of it, was pale. So when you see the white, pale host, Think of Christ, and then the two hands of the priest are the two thieves hanging on the cross uh, on Calvary. Let's go to the cross with Mary. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.